Hi, Dad Can here. Today I'm reading number two in the Geronimo Stilton series, The Curse of the Cheese Pyramid. Before we get to the story, I'd like to continue on my Cheeses from Around the World series, and today we're looking at South Korea and Imsol cheese. Now, Imsol cheese first started when a Belgian came to South Korea and started producing milk from his two goats. From there, it's turned into a cheese theme park that you can visit in the town of Imsol in South Korea. Okay, now, if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin. Wake up! Wake up! It was just before dawn in the middle of winter. The moon shone down over the mouse holes of New Mouse City. I was fast asleep under my comfy, cosy blankets, snoring away. Suddenly, the phone rang. I stumbled out of bed, sinking my paws into my new cat fur rug. It was so soft. I had bought it just last weekend at the fur mart with my Uncle Nibbles. It was expensive but worth every penny. Still half asleep, I stared down at the fluffy carpet. Then I picked up the phone. Hello, Stilton speaking. Geronimo Stilton, I mumbled. A strangely familiar voice shrieked back at me. Wake up, it cried. Wake up. My ears were ringing like church bells at Christmas time. Uh, who? What? Who is it? I stammered but the mad Shrieger had already hung up. I glanced at the alarm clock. Rancid rat hairs! It was six o'clock in the morning! I dove back under my covers and continued snoring. I woke up again at eight o'clock. I called a taxi to take me to the office. I arrived at nine o'clock sharp. Oh yes, I forgot to mention that I run a newspaper. It's called the Rodents Gazette. It is the most popular newspaper on Mouse Island. I'd like to say the paper's a success just because of me, but I have lots of help. Still, I'm the big cheese at the office. As I was saying, I got to work at nine o'clock sharp. I opened the door to my office wide and found myself snap to snap with my grandfather, William Shortpaws, also known as Cheap Mouse Willie. Grandfather William is a tough-talking mouse. Everyone at the office is afraid of him. That's because he's the founder of the Rodents Gazette. My wallet bleeds. I barely had taken two poor steps into the room when Grandfather William began shouting at me. Grandson, how dare you arrive at this hour, he thundered. I cringed. Where had I heard that shrieking voice before? But, Grandfather, it's nine o'clock. This is when the office opens, I explained. Grandfather William just shook his head. Ridiculous, he cried. Do you realize you've slept half the day away, grandson? I've been here since six o'clock. A light went on inside my mouse-sized brain. So that was the shrieking voice I had heard on the phone this morning. Thanks for the wake-up call, I grumbled. Curling his whiskers, he sniggered with satisfaction. Now you listen to me, sonny boy, he ordered, pulling my ear. Things are looking bad around here. Very bad indeed. Do you know why? I opened my mouth to reply, but he didn't give me a chance to answer. I'll tell you why, he bellowed. Because you're spending too much. Too much. Too much. You must economize. Economize, economize, economize. Then he stuck his snout in my ear. Do you know the meaning of the word, my dear grandson? He hollered at the top of his lungs. I'm talking Economize. E as in end this extravagance immediately. C as in cut back on all expenses. O as in on your toes things are about to change. N as in no more spending. O as in oh what a mess you've made of things. M as in mend your ways grandson or I'm taking back the firm. I as in I feel sick when I hear such things. Z, as in zero, zilch, no spending. E, as in economize on everything. I gulped. Why, as in yikes, I thought. 
and I guess it wouldn't be a good time to tell Grandfather William about the expensive leather love seat I had ordered for my office. But, Grandfather, I began. He pulled my other ear. Grandfather, my poor, starting today, I'm keeping track of everything, he shouted, waving the account books under my snout. I expect to see lots of changes. For example, how did you get here this morning? I chewed my whiskers. Well, I took a taxi, I replied. He slammed his paw on the table. Exactly. This is what I'm talking about. My wallet bleeds when I hear such things. He grabbed me by the tie. Grandson, from now on you'll take the subway to work. No, even better, you'll come on poor. This way you'll save on the fare and you'll get in first rat shape. I felt completely dazed and confused. I tried to sit down to catch my breath. But when I looked around for a chair, I realized Grandfather William had already made some changes, some perfectly horrifying changes. All my furniture was gone. The desk designed for me by the famous architect Frank Lloyd Rat was nowhere in sight. I whirled around in shock. What had happened to my precious leather paw chair? My imported Cheshire cat fur carpet? My expensive artwork and my priceless library? The office was empty. My heart sank like the big ball of cheese in Singing Stone Plaza on New Year's Eve. I'd been robbed by my own relative. A plastic table and a plastic chair were the only pieces of furniture in the whole room. Grandfather looked around satisfied. I sold everything to a second poor dealer, he said with a smug smile. You don't need any furniture, just a chair to sit on and a table to write on. As he spoke, he banged his paw on the plastic table, which began to wobble. Quick as a rat half his age, Grandfather caught the table edge before it tipped over. I may have grey fur, he exclaimed, but this rodent's not dead yet. I've still got it. I swallowed hard. Grandfather, you sold my precious furniture to a second poor dealer, I squeaked. How much did he give you? He waved a wad of money under my snout. Look at that, he boasted. Not bad, huh? I counted the money and went pale. But this is way too little. Those were antique books. Valuable paintings, I cried, shaking my head in disbelief. And they were mine. By now my head was spinning. I was in a sad state. I was either going to pull out all my fur or sob like a newborn mouselet. Grandfather William didn't seem to notice. He stuffed the money back into his wallet. Then he shouted, Grandson, you're about to get a lesson in business you'll never forget. Remember, I am the founder of this firm. I can shut it down with a twitch of my tail. I fired them all. Just then, I noticed something else. The office was so quiet. Where were the reporters, the editors, the proofreaders and the secretaries? Could they all be taking a coffee break? Somehow, I didn't think so. I had a terrible feeling. My whiskers began to tremble. Grandfather, I squeaked, where is everyone? He plopped down on a chair and grinned. He looked like a cat who had just swallowed a plump Thanksgiving mouse. I thought you'd never ask, grandson, he said, laughing. He pulled me closer and put his snout up to my ear. I came up with a most brilliant idea, he whispered. And then he suddenly shouted at the top of his lungs, I fired them all! Have you any idea how much money we're going to save by getting rid of those cheese guzzlers? I jumped. Something was ringing, and it wasn't the phone. It was my ear. You fired everyone, I stammered. But, Grandfather, how are we supposed to run the paper? He snorted, waving his paw in the air. Grandson, I've made up my mind. The paper will be run by the family, our family, the Stilton family, he declared. Just then, the door banged open, and three rodents charged into the office. The first was my cousin Trap Stilton, also known as Pushy Paws. He's a plump mouse with a loud voice who loves to tell terrible jokes. He's had a ton of different jobs, including ship's cook, cheese taster, stunt mouse, and extra in a horror movie. He played a zombie rat in a graveyard scene. Once he even took a job with a circus training fleas to do silly tricks. Next came my sister Thea. She is the Rodent Gazette's special correspondent. Thea could fly a plane, scuba dive, 
and ride a motorcycle. She's a black belt in karate. She has big violet eyes and more charm than last year's Miss Mouse Island. They has got a new sweetheart every week. It's true. That sister of mine could convince a starving rat to give up his last stick of cheddar cheese. Of course, Thea is also Grandfather William's favourite. The last mouse in the door was my adorable favourite nephew, Benjamin. He's nine years old and the sweetest, most amazing little mouse ever. Oh, how I love my precious nephew. Geronimo do this. Geronimo do that. Grandfather William eyed us with pride. My dear, dear family, he said, hold on to your tails. We're about to save more money than Scrooge Rat during the holidays. Let's see. First, Geronimo can sort the mail and sweep the floors starting at five in the morning. During the day, Geronimo can also write the articles, take them to the printer, answer the phone, make photocopies, go to the post office, etc., etc., etc. I held up my paw in protest. Wait a minute. Geronimo do this. Geronimo do that. Why do I have to do it all? Grandfather William just shook his head sadly. Well, cry me a river of cheese, he said. Geronimo, I'm surprised at you. Why can't you be more like your unselfish little sister? He then began to explain how Thea would be in charge of interviewing all of New Mouse City's VIRs, very important rodents. She'd be going to parties and hanging out with celebrity mice while I swept up mouse hairs. I was fuming. But there was no sense squeaking about it. Thea was Grandfather's darling, and that was that. To prove my point, my sister twirled around the office, showing off her new designer fur jacket. Do you like it, Grandfather? she asked. I charged it to the paper. After all, I need to look fashionable in my position. Grandfather William beamed at her with pride. Of course, my dear sweet Thea, he agreed. You charge anything you want to the paper. My sister threw me a smug smile. I bit my tongue. So much for economize, 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 I muttered under my breath. Just then, trapped past Grandfather a basket full of sandwiches. They're your favorite, Grandfather. Blue cheese with extra garlic and red hot chili peppers. Grandfather licked his whiskers and began nibbling away on a sandwich. This really hits the spot, he declared. What would I do without you, my dear grandson? Trap winked at me and announced, Grandfather has hired me to be his personal cook. This was ridiculous. I was getting hotter than a bag of cheese popcorn in a microwave. Who would help me run the paper? At that moment, I felt a tug on the sleeve of my jacket. It was my young nephew, Benjamin. Uncle Geronimo, guess what, he beamed. Grandfather William has hired me to be his personal assistant. Grandfather stroked Ben's tiny ears. Ah, the family. There's nothing like the family, the Stilton family, that is. I snorted. I could see I was a work mouse of the family. It looked like I would be the only one doing any work. Suddenly, Grandfather whirled around toward me. Uh-oh, what next? Maybe he'd asked me to sharpen all the pencils by paw. Or maybe he'd want me to chop up twigs to make our own paper. Geronimo, it seems you're not happy with your duties, he began. Here it comes, I groaned silently. Well, I've got a little surprise for you, grandson, he continued. He stuck a DC plane ticket under my snout. Here you are. I'm sending you on a little trip. That's right. A trip far away from Mouse Island. You're going to Egypt to do a special report on the pyramids. I can hardly believe it. I felt like a new mouse. I hate traveling, but I've always wanted to see the pyramids. It was a dream come true. I stared at the tickets. Thank you, Grandfather, I said, gasping. When do I leave? He put his snout right up to my ear. Now, he screamed. My ear was ringing again. But this time, I didn't care. I was off to Egypt. Good luck. I was so excited. It isn't every day a mouse leaves the island to travel to Egypt. At the airport, I searched for my ticket counter. Excuse me, where is the DC Airlines check-in? I asked a mouse in an airport uniform. She gave me a look full of pity. DC Airlines? You mean dirt cheap airlines? She asked. She pointed to a cardboard box. 
Good luck, she called as I headed for the box. Good luck, I repeated to myself. What was that supposed to mean? Behind the box stood a plump ticket agent with greasy whiskers. She looked me over suspiciously. Are you sure you want to get on this flight, she barked. You're not going to scamper off at the last minute, are you? I blinked. Why would I do that? I asked, confused. Just then, a shady-looking mouse approached me. Hello, my fairy friend, he crooned, pumping my paw in a crushing paw shake. I am Sammy Slickpaw, but you can just call me Slick. I winced, checking my paw for broken bones. Slick just grinned wider. I am here to offer you a life insurance policy, he continued. Did you ever think your plane might crash? I turned white. My heart started racing like Mario Mousetti at the track. Um, well, I try not to think about it, I mumbled. He nodded gravely. Well, you really should, he said softly. I mean, one minute these planes are up, the next minute they're down. Do you have any idea how many planes crash each year? I gulped. I didn't really want to know. Just think, Slick rattled on. If you had a little life insurance, then your loved ones would be taken care of. Come on, sign here and take a load off your mind. He shoved a piece of paper under my snout. What a slick sales mouse, I thought. But then I felt a pang in my heart. What would happen to little Benjamin if I were in mouse heaven? What about his future? Would he end up begging for mouldy cheese crumbs instead of heading off to a college? Maybe an insurance policy wasn't such a bad idea after all. I pulled out my pen, but before I could sign the paper, Slick held up a paw. Just one little question before we do the deal, he said. You're not flying with dirt cheap airlines, are you? I blinked. Um, well, yes, as a matter of fact I am, I answered. Quick as a water rat doing the paw stroke, he snatched the paper back. Forget it, he squeaked. I can't insure anyone flying with them. They're the worst. It's far too risky. I was beginning to get a terrible twinge in the pit of my stomach. Oh, what a day. Curdle me sour. Chewing my whiskers, I headed off to find a plane. A small sign that said, Dirt Cheap, Departing Flights, was tacked to the wall. It looked like some mouse had scribbled it with crayons. I turned down a dark hallway. At the end of the hall stood the plane. My fur broke out in a cold sweat when I saw it. Curdle me sour! Grandfather William had cut costs to the tailbone. The plane was all patched up. It looked like it wouldn't make it off the runway. As I approached, I noticed the mechanic banging his hammer on one of the wings. There, he grunted. Maybe we won't crash this time. I gripped my suitcase tightly and climbed on board. A chubby flight attendant took my ticket. You're in class, said, she informed me. Look like someone's been cutting costs to the tailbone, huh? She waved me over to seat 17. It was a tiny, tattered, wicker chair. Instead of a seat belt, there was a piece of string. I tried not to scream. Still, my cold sweat had turned into a cold shower. I sat down carefully. Then I tied my string belt in a double knot. Oh, how did I get myself into this mess? Meanwhile, the plump flight attendant was making an announcement. Does anyone wish to buy a parachute? This is your last chance. Take him or leave him, she snarled. My whiskers trembled. A, a p parachute, I stammered. But why? The flight attendant scowled. Hello in there, she called, tapping my head with a paw. Have you seen what this plane looks like? I stared out my broken window. My double knotted string belt had already snapped in two. Seconds later, I had selected a red, white and blue parachute. The flight attendant pointed to the price tag. Curdle me sour, I shrieked. The parachute probably cost more than the whole plane. Does it matter? The flight attendant asked. How much do you value your life? With a sigh, I paid. Just as the engines began to buzz, the flight attendant leaned over me. For the same price, I'll sell you an inner tube, too, she whispered. I strongly advise it. After all, we'll be flying over the ocean. One engine started to sputter. It sounded like a cat with a fur ball stuck in its throat. Things were not looking good. I threw more money at the flight attendant and grabbed the inner tube. Suddenly, a voice screamed over the loudspeaker. Good morning, Rounds. This is your captain, Crash Ratjack. My co-pilot today is Ted Simplesnout. 
I'd also like to introduce our flight attendant, Miss Sally Skinny Fur. In a few minutes, Miss Skinny Fur will be serving you a cheese snack to everyone except those in Class Z. During the flight, you'll have a chance to watch our movie, Bat Mouse and Robin, except, of course, those in Class Z. The restrooms are at the rear of the plane for everyone except those in Class Z who've been provided with bedpans. I peeked under my seat. A metal bowl stared back at me. I crossed my legs and tried not to think of streams, waterfalls, or the place where I get my car washed. As the captain signed off, I tried to relax, but I heard the voices. It was a captain and a co-pilot speaking. Simple snout, did you remember to fill up? asked the captain. The co-pilot let out an ear-piercing squeak. Slimy Swiss balls, he cried. I completely forgot, boss. But we have a tailwind, so we should make it. You really think so? the captain asked with a sigh. Simple Snout giggled. Sure, want to bet on it, boss? he said. I say with the tailwind, we can just about make it. Anyway, if worse comes to worse, we can always do an emergency landing. It wouldn't be the first one, right? And besides, over there in Egypt, it's full of sand. So we're sure to hit something soft. The captain groaned. Simple Snout, you really are short on the brains department, he declared. But I don't feel like waiting for the fuel truck. Let's just take off and see what happens. I jumped out of my seat in a panic. I want to get off, I squeaked. I headed for the front of the plane. The flight attendant blocked my way. Cheese sticks, it's too late now, you noodle brain. She shoved me back into my seat. We're about to take off. The engines buzzed more loudly. The plane took off down the runway. Then it wobbled into the air. I let out a silent scream. My fur stood on end. It really was too late. Too late to get off the plane. Too late to switch flights. Too late to show Grandfather William who the real boss was. I was risking my life on a plane with no fuel, flown by two wacky pilots. Oh, what a day. How do you do? I'm Daniel E. Deadfur. The plane took off with a sputter and a cough. For the next two hours, we sailed along without a problem. Then, all of a sudden, the plane began shaking. No, I don't mean a polite little trembling kind of shaking. I'm talking about violent jerking shaking. It reminded me of the time I got locked in my great uncle Coldpaw's walk-in freezer overnight. I was shaking so hard from the cold, I was seeing double. By the time they found me, I looked like a furry fudge pop. Miss Skinny Fur's voice interrupted my thoughts. Passengers are kindly requested to hold their passports between their teeth, she instructed. This way your fur will be easily identified in case we crash. I gripped my wicker chair tightly. Maybe if I tried humming a tune, I'd feel better, I decided. Yes, a happy little jingle might do the trick. But before I could think of one, the mouse behind me beat me to it. Only, he wasn't humming a happy tune. He was humming a song that made grown mice cry. It was called Goodbye, Sweet Cheese, Goodbye. I turned around. I was snout to snout with a very odd-looking mouse. He wore a black wig and was dressed all in purple from his tail to his whiskers. His moustache drooped sadly over his snout. He wore a very unusual watch on his paw. It had a picture of an open coffin with a smiling mouse lying inside. He was reading a book with a dusty cover. It was called A Rodent's Guide to the World's Most Beautiful Cemeteries. I gulped. I wouldn't want to run into this mouse in a dark alley. He was creepier than a ghost cat on Halloween. Allow me to introduce myself, the sad mouse said in a gloomy tone. My name is Daniel E. Deadfur. I'm an undertaker. I nodded. Now I knew why old Deadfur was so depressed. He spent his day staring at stiffs. With a heavy sigh, the unhappy mouse stared out the window. Looks like we might crash, he predicted. Oh well, I guess you win some, you lose some. My whiskers stood on end. Holy cheese, I croaked. The undertaker blinked. You sound surprised, he said, startled. You must know air travel is very, very, very dangerous. Plus, we're sitting right on top of the wing. Do you know the wing is the most dangerous place to be when a plane goes down? By now I felt faint. I tried taking deep breaths, but my lungs didn't seem to be working. Spots swam before my eyes. No, I screamed. I'm too young to go. 
I haven't climbed Mouse Everest yet. I haven't trekked through the great Mousewood Forest, and besides, I still have a whole unopened package of cheddar cheese bars at home in my fridge. Too bad no one heard me. I was so scared I had completely lost my squeak. Frozen with fear. Terrified, I squeezed my special lucky charm. It was a silver four-leaf clover. My nephew Benjamin had given it to me for my birthday. A tear slid down my fur. I wondered if I would ever see my beloved nephew again. The plane was jumping up and down like my sister Thea in her step-class at Ratzler Lane. I was frozen with fear. Why, oh why, did I get on this rat-trap of a plane? Just as I was about to drown in my own tears, we stopped bouncing. The flight attendant made an announcement. The turbulence is over, she squeaked. Passengers are requested to keep their seat belts fastened. We'll be landing in half an hour. I heaved a sigh of relief. I knew we would make it, I told myself. But, of course, I spoke too soon. Seconds later, disaster struck. The engines died. The silence was sickening. Why did I tell you, simple snout? The captain's voice squeaked. I won the bet. I told you the fuel wouldn't last. I could hear the co-pilot grumbling. OK, boss, I guess you won. Looks like we need to try that emergency landing again, he sighed. My eyes popped open. Emergency landing? Help, I shrieked. I couldn't take it any more. My nerves were shot. What did I do to deserve this ending? I tried to be a good big brother to Thea. I know I was a doting uncle to Benjamin. And then, of course, there was my cousin Trap. Well, I guess I could try to be a better cousin. But Trap was so annoying. He loved to play mean jokes on me. Like on my birthday when he put hot chilli peppers in my cheesecake. I stared out my broken window. Think positive, I told myself. The plane circled over the ocean. Then it headed for the desert. It looked like we were about to dive straight into the sand. I squeezed my eyes shut. Then suddenly I heard a noise. Could it be? It was. The engines had started up again. With a jolt, we finally reached Cairo Airport. Wobbling, I headed for the exit. Crunchy cheese chunks! What a nightmare, I squeaked. I'm surprised I didn't die of fright. Daniel E. Deadfur scampered after me. If you think you're about to go, just give me a call, he said. He handed me his card. I shook my head and bolted out the door. Oh, what a day! Professor Alrat Spitfer. In the airport, I read Grandfather William's instructions again. I had to interview Professor Alrat Spitfer. He'd invented a new way to create energy. I wondered what it could be. I loved hearing about scientific discoveries. Then I could write about them in my paper. I was getting into a taxi when my cell phone rang. Hello, this is Stilton, Geronimo Stilton, I answered. Grandfather's voice blew out my eardrum. Rotten rat's teeth, he shrieked. Did you not hear one word I said, grandson? Am I talking just to hear my own voice? Doesn't anyone listen any more? If a tree fell in a forest and no one was around, would it make a sound? I stared at the phone. I had no idea what my grandfather was babbling about. You're on a budget, he squeaked at last. Forget the taxi, grandson. Hire a camel. And don't forget to ask for a discount. I haggled with a camel driver. Then I climbed in between a camel's humps. One thing you should know about riding a camel is just like being on a boat. I was soon seasick. Yes, I, Geronimo Stilton, got seasick on dry land. Oh, what a day! I reached the laboratory an hour later. By that time, I looked like a tired lump of mouldy green cheese. The lab was a concrete building sitting in the middle of the desert. I lurched up the steps and rang the doorbell. And that's when it hit me. The most horrible smell you could ever imagine. I held my breath. It was unbearable. By the time the door opened, I was turning blue. A funny-looking rodent with red fur and thick glasses peered out at me. He wore a white lab coat and had a clothespin on his nose. Hey there, I'm Professor Alrat Spitfer, he squeaked warmly. He had to keep gasping for air because of the clothespin. You must be Geronimo Stilton. I received a phone call from your grandfather, William Shortpaws, also known as Cheap Mouse Willie. 
He must be some mouse. Yes, I'm Geronimo Stilton, and you're right. My grandfather is some mouse, I gasped. Some kind of crazy, wacko, infuriating mouse, I added under my breath. The professor pulled a clothespin out of his pocket. You might want to wear this, he advised. Now come along, I'll show you around the laboratory. I realized the stench was getting stronger and stronger. I quickly stuck the clothespin on my nose. Professor Spitfur led me into a stable. It was where they bred hundreds of camels. You wouldn't believe the stink! Professor Spitfur began to explain about his incredible discovery. You do know about the formula for supersonic, supersensitive, super-duper magnetic force, don't you? he asked. As he spoke, I had to keep hopping back and forth. It turns out the professor wore dentures. Every time he opened his mouth, streams of rat spit shot out at me. I know I needed a shower after my flight, but this was ridiculous. Oh, what a day! Oh, what a day! Inside the stable, the camels looked harmless enough. They stood peacefully together, making strange gurgling sounds. I pulled out my notebook and began taking notes. Meek, mild creatures sound like they're blowing bubbles underwater. I approached one to get a closer look. Be careful, the professor quickly warned me. Never look a camel straight in the eye. They love to spit, and they're wonderful shots. I immediately jumped back, but it was too late. The camel whipped his snout around toward me and spit. He hit me right in the eye. Yuck! I groaned, wiping my eye with my paw. It was bad enough I had to dodge the professor's spit. Now I had to worry about the camel's spit, too. See? I told you, splattered the professor, shaking his head. I decided to stay away from the camel's snout. I snuck behind the second camel. This one didn't spit on me. Instead, he kicked me right in the tail. Crying out in pain, I took a step backward, right into a pile of camel dung. I slipped on the dung, did a triple somersault, and bruised my snout when I hit the ground. Oh, what a day, what a day, what a day! What a smell, what a stench, what a stink! Just then, Professor Spitfur began shrieking. Look out, what are you doing? That's very precious raw material, he cried. I scanned the stable, scratching my fur. What? What raw material? I stammered. The smell in the stable was making me dizzy. I felt faint. It was worse than the time my grouchy grandma one whisker burned her revolting blue cheese and gouda casserole. The professor lowered his voice, as if he were about to let me in on a big secret. You must have figured it out by now, right? he whispered. The raw material I use to produce energy is camel dung. He dragged me out of the laboratory. Then he pointed to a yellow building in the shape of a Swiss cheese pyramid. Smelly brown smoke drifted out from its chimney. Beside the chimney stood some huge solar panels. I use the sun to fuel the boiler. Then I ferment the camel dung, the professor explained. The fumes turn on an engine that creates energy. I gasped, choked by the fumes. What a smell! What a stench! What a stink! I'm never going to get the stink out of my fur, I thought. No one will want to sit next to me on the plane ride home. They'll have to hand out clothespins to the other passengers. Or maybe they'll give me a special seat, attached to the outside of the plane. Oh well, I couldn't worry about that now. I was getting too excited about the professor's discovery. It looked like his invention really worked. I glanced down at my notes. Professor Spitfur, are you saying that camel dung can make energy? I asked. The professor shook his head and chuckled. Well, not exactly, he explained. You see, you also need a secret ingredient, a strictly hush-hush ingredient that I hide in here. As he spoke, he hid his forehead with his paw. I kept on writing. Ingredient. Big secret. In here. Yes, Stelton, the professor splattered on. I keep the secret inside my creaky old brain, my noggin, my think box. And do you know, Stilton, where I got the idea for the secret ingredient from? Do you, Stilton? Well, do you? I hopped about. The professor was getting more excited than a cat on a royal rodent luxury cruise ship. He was spitting up a storm. No, I answered, trying to avoid another shower of rat saliva. How should I know? The professor lowered his voice again and squeaked. 
I got the idea from the ancient writing inside Cheops' pyramid. The Eye of Ra My ears perked up. Cheops was one of the great pharaohs of Egypt. The pyramid that Cheops was buried inside was the biggest one ever built. Now I was getting really excited, mostly because I was going to learn more about an amazing pyramid, but also because a breeze had started blowing. The professor and I were able to take off our clothespins. I rubbed my nose, then continued scribbling in my notebook. I'm really an Egyptologist, the professor explained. That means I'm an expert in Egyptian culture. Anyway, one day I was inside the Cheops Pyramid studying some hieroglyphs when I got my idea. The ancient writing showed pictures of lots of camels and the sun. It was the Eye of Ra. I started thinking about camels and the sun. An idea started buzzing in my head. Maybe the two could work together to make energy. The professor showed me an old piece of paper covered with painted symbols. There were flowers, boats, crocodiles, owls, even cats. These are hieroglyphs, he said. Then he scratched his fur. Say, I have an idea. Would you like to visit Cheops Pyramid, Stilton? he asked. My eyes opened wide. Would a mouse like cheesecake on his birthday? I sure would, I squeaked. That's the end of part one. Please make sure you subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell so you'll find out when part two will be uploaded. Until then, good night. I want you to dream. I want you to dream.